I think I'd be ignorant to say that Christianity is the only right religion. I don't know what the right religion is. It's just what I believe it is. Some people that I've met, it's just, I've had friends, and, and the minute they find out about me or the minute that I, I do anything that doesn't follow their religion, I'm, they don't want anything to do with me. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad that can come out of it. And I'm not sure if it's from religion that the bad or the good comes out of it or whether it's the people. I respect a lot of faiths and I think that Christianity is a pillar that's influenced by the other great religions in the world. La Christianity is very important because we can learn the values of Christians where we can discover more about ourselves. My view on anyone who claims to have a monopoly on truth is that there's no one truth about anything. I think that a lot of religions say the same thing in different ways. Well, again, welcome back um, to week four of Explore God, whereas the, the video, our introductory video um, showed us, we're dealing with this question this morning, is Christianity too narrow in our culture? Which I think is a, a, an incredibly relevant question that many of us ask and wrestle with in a variety of different ways. And, and every week, as we've tried to take on each of these questions, and we try to deal with them in an honest and a forthright way, I, I've tried to consider it not just merely from the perspective of an intellectual conversation or a debate or anything like that, but really, really trying to drive at or understand the heart of the question especially specifically from the perspective of somebody that is wrestling with that. That's the question for them of, of the seven that we're dealing with. There are the questions that we ask in life. That's the one that, that, that is at the forefront of, of their thought and life. I remember several years ago, I was flying with a group of our students down to um, Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, where we were partnering with a local church down there and doing some ministry work, and um, every pastor, by the way, has some story on an airplane where you get in a spiritual conversation. Um, it's like a requirement. And this was my moment, right? I'm on this flight, and the, the man next to me sits down and starts to talk about what I do for a living and ask a few questions. So I told him, I'm, I'm on this trip. I've got all these students, and we're partnering with a church down in, in Cabo, and they're just doing some incredible work. And he was really curious. And really, the next four hours of that flight, nonstop, was just an ongoing, very polite, very um, respectful conversation between him and I around our belief system, around why we live life the way that we do. I mean, he was very interested, and he asked thoughtful questions, and he, he defined himself as a, a Jewish agnostic, and so we were looking for points that, that we shared in common and asking questions about where we differed. And at the end of the conversation, as, as we were sort of preparing to land and recognizing that our time together was, was coming to a conclusion, he said to me, he said, it's great that your faith in Jesus works for you, and it's great that this, this works for me. He says, I think after all, isn't that what's really important? And I've thought about that conversation many, many times over the years. And I've realized that for my friend in that moment on, on the plane, there were really two significant things that sort of informed his viewpoint. One was just sheerly pragmatism. Like in his sense is well, what works for you, which I think to be fair, we all do that to a certain degree. I think that's something we all look for in terms of how we form and shape our worldview and our understanding. And so in his mind, what he believed is his agnosticism informed by his Jewish background was answering his questions. And, and so, and my faith in Jesus was answering mine and, and, and so great. But secondly, and I think more importantly for him as he thought about his viewpoint, his perspective was that it was, it was about sincerity. That if someone's belief is sincere, then it is, is valid and it is effective. So because of the fact that both of our beliefs were, were working for us, he felt like it was answering the questions that he had in his life and mine was doing the same for me. And because both of us were sincere in that, then it sort of met the criteria that is essential for claiming truth, that, that both were in essence equally valid. 
In addition, by that standard, really any number of people could have joined our conversation. And if they met those qualifications, then their perspective or their viewpoint would be equally valid. But what was problematic for me is that in the course of our conversation, as we talked about and got each other's perspectives on on how we viewed the world, particularly on on the topics of how we understood and related to the the nature of truth and, and what we saw or understood or believed salvation to mean, that, that we had almost, those were in conflict with each other. I wouldn't say that diametrically opposed per se, but they, they were mutually exclusive. The way that we viewed, we disagreed on those points to the point that, that both of us could not be right, no matter how sincere our, our beliefs were. See, we wrestle with this question in our culture. We, we wrestle with this in, in the life of the church. We live in an increasingly diverse world, and because of technology, we have increasingly high degrees of exposure to diversity in culture, diversity in religion, philosophy, worldview. And so for anybody to claim, as we saw in the video, some level of exclusivity or to to claim to hold the, the right perspective on truth, oftentimes, Um, brings with it accusations of of arrogance um, or intolerance. And and, and again, sometimes when we're wrestling with this, those feel almost justified. What gives you the right to say your perspective is right and someone else's is wrong? So one of the ways that this question gets framed, I think, sometimes even in the life of, of the church is something like this. Is there room for the Christian faith to recognize that there might be other ways to God? While you have found your way through Christ, is it possible that others have found their way through other means? Or, or perhaps put differently, and I've heard it said this way, is that aren't all of the different religions and the different worldviews, aren't they just sort of paths on the same mountain? And, and they're just leading us all to that one pinnacle moment, which is a relationship with God, that same destination. Of course, the challenge with that is that these paths are all unique, and these paths make exclusive claims. Uh, exclusive claims that are, that are contrary to each other. In fact, any real understanding of, of truth involves the idea of exclusivity, right? Any conversation around that. Because for me to say or to qualify something as truth, that is also then to say that something else is, is untrue. And so when we're looking at this, this topic of narrowness, We need to understand that this is not a question or a perspective that's unique to Christianity. Any any worldview, any religion, any philosophy that seeks to inform how we live our lives is claiming some degree of truth, and by that, there's some degree of exclusivity that goes with it. And so the question, is Christianity too narrow? I I would say to that that Christianity, the claims of Jesus are narrow, but they are not narrow in an attempt to exclude people, but rather narrow in an effort to be clear and to be specific about what it means to be saved, about the nature of truth and how we experience and discover salvation. I want to look this morning at a passage in Acts 17. Where, where Paul is um, speaking, and so Paul was, was at, when we're first introduced to Paul, Paul is, is diametrically opposed to Christians and the Christian movement. Um, he is convinced of his worldview and his way of life, and, and he is actively opposing anyone who is proclaiming that Jesus has been risen from the dead, so much so that he's seeking to hunt down and, and persecute people who are doing that. He has this powerful account with Jesus, uh, encounter with Jesus, and as a result of that, he becomes one of the leading uh, voices who is taking what we call the gospel or the message of Jesus out into Asia Minor, around the world. He's planting churches in all these different cities, and now in Acts, he shows up in the city of Athens. 
I'm going to read through this, this whole kind of encounter, and then we'll, we'll make a couple observations together. This is uh, Acts 17, beginning in verse 16. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Now, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is, what is this blabber, uh, blabber, blabberer trying to say? Others remarked, he must be advocating some foreign god. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Oropagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. Now all the Athenians and the, fo and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Oropagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at, at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you are worshiping. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out, uh, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. And God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. And now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This encounter is, is I think, helpful in our understanding of this question. And there's a couple of things that Paul highlights here that he addresses that I, I just want us to take notice of. Beginning with, and I think this is important, he starts by, by identifying or understanding or speaking into this universal need a universal need. On that same trip that I referred to earlier when I took the students to Mexico, we were working with a local partner there who was building a, a ministry center. And we were at the, this was, we were just starting to set the foundation. So we got there and one of the projects that they had for us was to dig this massive hole that was gonna hold a water storage tank. And, and so they gave us the tools that, that they had, it was a shovel and some pickaxes and some crowbars, and we got started, motivated, excited about this. And we chipped into that dirt and it was like concrete. Like, I mean, it was, we worked all day and if we got an inch, that was a miracle. And, and you could kind of see as the day was going on, the kids were getting frustrated. This was supposed to be about 15 feet deep. Um, and so it was just a massive hole in the ground and we could see like, we're going to, we're going to let these people down. We're never going to be able to do this. And it was about that time that one of my adult leaders noticed a, a backhoe driving down the road and dropped a shovel really quick, ran out and, and flagged the guy down and was having a conversation. And, and all of a sudden you see this guy turn around and start making, you kind of see the students like, yeah, you know, like. And, and I said, what, 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 what'd you say? And I just said, how much is this gonna cost? <laughs> and the guy said 50 bucks. And I was like, that is the best 50 bucks we have ever spent in our lives. <laughs> See, it didn't matter how long we were there. It, it, no matter how good our intentions were in that attempt, that effort, 
the tools, the, the means that we use to accomplish that task was ineffective. It was, it was not going to get done what needed to be done. See, in verse 16, Paul, it says, he is greatly distressed to see this city full of idols. Later on, when he begins to speak to the Oropagus, he says, this is verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Oropagus and said, people of Athens. He says, I see that you're very religious. For as I walked around carefully and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. I see that you, in order to cover all your bases, you've created an altar to a God that you don't know just to make sure you're not leaving somebody out. So you are uh, uh, ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you, Paul says. So So Paul in Athens is speaking into a culture of diversity and a culture of religious pluralism. He's speaking to a group of people that were familiar with and comfortable with the exchange of philosophies and worldview. This is, this said commonplace. This is what they did all day. This is the home of people like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. It's the center of of thought and understanding in the ancient world. And so Paul speaks, when he speaks, he goes right after this essential question that they continue to ask, that they continue to wrestle with, which is evident all around them. And that is simply, how do we relate to God? Who is God and how do we relate to him? So Paul, in view of these many idols, in view of this idol that is inscribed to this unknown God, seeks to provide an answer to the question they continue to ask. He does so by challenging the idea of worshiping created things as opposed to the worship of the creator of all things. Last week when we were, we were talking about the experience of pain and suffering in life, we talked about Genesis chapter 3 and and the ramifications of, of rebellion and the consequences of sin when it enters into the story of God. And how from that moment forward, humanity has been working towards rediscovering what was lost. Working towards gaining, once again, this uninhibited relationship with our creator God. Which again, in, in, in week one of Explore God, we talked about, I, I made the case that that is our designed purpose. That is ultimately our meaning in life. And so religion is is humankind's answer to this universal need. It's, It's religion is our attempt to regain what was lost. It's humanity's attempt to make their way back to God. But but our best efforts are man-made and fall short. Paul, Paul elaborates on this. In the book of Ephesians, um, the perspective here is different because when he's writing to Ephesians, this is, this is being communicated to a, a group of people who have already entered into a relationship. They've already committed their lives to Christ. So he's, this is written in the past tense now because he's saying, don't forget. Don't forget what your condition was. This is Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So that, 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 that passage almost sounds harsh. But, but what Paul is getting at here is that all of our attempts are leaving us wanting because our condition isn't one of, of spiritual woundedness. According to Paul, he's saying our condition is spiritual death. We are incapable of resolving our most critical need, our, 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 this universal problem that Paul identifies in Acts 17. And it's no less true now than it was then. Paul is seeing all the symptoms in Athens. He looks around at the idol worship. He looks around at people's efforts to to restore and to get back and to appease the wrath of this angry God that they perceived. And he identifies the condition and he says, everything, all the effort in the world won't resolve this problem. It won't meet this need. I think it's 
easy at times to look at a, a, something like Acts 17 and to think this is a completely different culture and a completely different time, that haven't we come a long way? See, but the heart of the issue remains the same. The heart of the issue of, of, of our attempts to, to restore, to be right, in right relationship with God is when, when we depend on, on mere religion, that's just more efforts at, at being a good enough person. It's, it's more efforts at living a good life. It's like a life, uh, like my friend on the plane, his sense was that his objective was if I can leave this place better than I found it, then I will have fulfilled my call in life. It's all of our, our efforts to be, be a little bit more religious than the person around us to hope when it's all added up at the end of the time that the scale tips in our favor and it's all just our effort to resolve this fundamental problem. And Paul says no matter what you do and no matter how hard you work, it won't accomplish that. And so then he goes on now and he speaks into this universal need. So when we're talking about narrowness, Paul begins by leveling the playing ground. And he says, There's all, there is a need that every single one of us has. And now he speaks into that need and he talks about God's great provision. God's great provision. When I was a, um, a student at Moody Bible, I um, got a job working as a security guard in the Swiss bank, which was housed in the Chicago Board of Trade. I worked Friday and Saturday night from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. Uh, is, is miserable. Um, <laughs> And part of our training that we went through in, in preparing to be a security guard when no one is there, and I got a tiny, tiny little flashlight, so I was like, we're gonna blind somebody if there's ever a threat. And, and they trained us on what to do if a bomb was ever discovered. And, and they literally, this is not a joke, they show these videos about, about this security guard kind of hovering over this bomb and then literally like he's shaking and he's trying to figure out what wire to cut and I was like I'm making ten dollars an hour <laughs> if there is a bomb in this building I'm not cutting any wires in fact I'm getting on the intercom and saying to everyone in there hey there's a bomb in the building if you want to know the quickest way out of here follow me right because <laughs> I know like that, that's what I knew, that's what I could offer them. If you wanna know specifically how to get out of here as quickly as possible, follow me, because that's where I'm going. See, Paul, when he's speaking here in Athens, in verse 18, he says that he notes that he's talking about the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Again, he elaborates on this in, in Ephesians. So he started in Ephesians chapter two, he talks about our spiritual condition one of spiritual death, but he does not leave us there. This is verse four now. He says, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. And it's by grace that you have been saved. God raised us up with Christ and seated us in the right hand, uh, seated us in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace that you've been saved, through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it's, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So Paul speaks in now to this, this universal need, and he says, I have great news. All the effort, all the energy, all the time and money that you have spent trying to make yourself acceptable to God, trying to, to appease his wrath, Paul says, stop. Stop. It's not getting the job done, and better yet, it's a job that's been done for us. He's saying if, if religion in all its forms is just humanity's efforts to reach God, he says, but the gospel then, the good news of the resurrected Jesus is that God has come to us. He's come through the person of Jesus, and he's come by the provision of grace. 
The Apostle John, when he's talking about Jesus arriving here in earth to enter in in human flesh, he describes it this way in John 1, 14. He says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So when John describes Jesus, he describes him as the one who is full of both truth and grace. He, he's not the perfect balance of truth and grace, but he is fully truth and he is fully grace. So Jesus speaks emphatically and honestly about the impact of sin and the, the nature of our need. But then he responds to that, he confronts that by being full of grace. That's how he deals with it. Now I wanna take just a moment here to, to talk about grace. Um, I, I saw in a, another sermon, uh, I think it was Andy Stanley, who defined grace as undeserved, unearned, and I think to Paul's point in Acts 17 and Ephesians 2, unearnable favor of God to us. His undeserved, unearned, unearnable favor to us. And he talks about how, how when we look at grace, if we, if we think that we have earned it, if we think it's something that we deserve, then we miss the entire point of grace. Stanley goes on to say, we can't recognize or receive grace for what it is until we're actually convinced that we don't deserve it. See, the message of the gospel is that, that Jesus came to be for us what we could not be for ourselves. That, that, that grace provided by Jesus meets this universal need. So, so when he died on the cross, he took the weight and the responsibility and the guilt of my sin and yours and everyone around us, and he carried it on the cross, and then by faith, he says, I will take my perfection and I will apply it to you. This is why Jesus says of himself in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' words here are narrow, but they're not exclusive, but rather clear. This is what he has done for us. This is why he came. Peter, when he is addressing the, the Sanhedrin in, in Acts chapter 4, he's, he's healed somebody, and, and, and the ruling council of the day want to know how this man was healed. He says this in Acts 4, verse, I'm going to jump down to verse 12 here. He says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which you must be saved. So his, this expression of Peter in these words is not an expression of intolerance, but rather one of invitation. It's the provision of grace that meets our most fundamental need. Jesus isn't the only way in attempt to keep people out. Jesus is the only way that God has provided for us, that he's given us this undeserved, unearned gift of grace. Jesus is not a religion. He, he is not another human effort that's, that's our, our attempt to make ourselves right with God. He is God who overcomes sin and enables us to have a relationship with him. And that is a very different thing. So if, if the need is universal and, and the provision is available to all, where Paul leaves us with then in Acts 17 is this, this personal response. If you look back in Acts 17, when Paul is talking to the, the uh, Athenians there, and he lands in this place of response, again in verse 31, he says, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. We're not... We're not going in today to, to the significance of the resurrection, but both you'll see Paul here, Peter, when he's talking in Acts chapter four, they, they constantly cite the resurrection as evidence for, for their claims. When Paul is dealing with this, he's saying there's a need that we all have and there's a provision that God has given to everyone, right? That's John three sixteen. God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. And so Paul, what he frames up here to to the, the men and women of Athens, what he frames up to us is then what is our response for God's provision? One of the the privileges that I have from time to time as a pastor is moments when somebody in in this group of people is is in need and somebody else becomes aware of that and and meets that need. And and because they desire to remain anonymous, because they just want it to be a gift, they'll sometimes come to me and say, hey, would would you deliver this gift to somebody? And of course, I'm always happy to do that. And, and whether it's a phone call or, or it's actually stopping at their house, I mean, literally there's been times when this is, this is an envelope with cash in it. And you come to somebody's house and you knock on the door and said, hey, there's somebody out there who loves you and uh, was aware of a need and they just wanted you to have this. And there's almost always in that moment just a sense of shock. Like a, a sense of, really? Like, and yeah, like you're sitting there almost like they, they feel afraid to kind of take it from you. They say, yeah, this, this thing that I'm holding, this is for you. Somebody loves you and has done this for you, and they want you to have it. And, and, and there's this, this processing that you can watch go on in their mind, and they're like, it's almost hard to believe, Right? That, that somebody would know enough and care enough and, and have the ability to provide for that need. And yet in that moment, what remains is their willingness to grab it and take hold of it and to claim it as their own. See, this is what Paul is depicting for us. The question that he's saying that we all have to answer at the end of our lives is the very same question that he posed to the people in Athens. And that is simply, how do we respond to Jesus? How how have we taken in by faith this gift of forgiveness and grace that he has made available to us? Because Paul's point is that all the spiritual merit badges that we might seek to to accumulate, to validate ourselves in front of a holy God, he's saying they land us in the same place. They land us short. He's saying that there's only one response that matters. And that's being found in Jesus. He's the only one who has effectively accomplished what we uh, need most. Matter of fact, if you look at the very end of this chapter, we won't open there today, but there's essentially three responses that we see in the text. It says that some people heard Paul and, and, and the, the, to them it was foolish. They, I think it says they sneered at him. Other people it said they, they, they asked more questions. They wanted to know more. They remained curious and desired to, to continue the conversation. And then it said, thirdly, some people believed. See, I think those, those questions, those responses remain the same that's true for us today. When we hear the nature of what God has done, how he has provided for us, the question continues, how will we respond? We began by asking ourselves this morning, is Christianity too narrow? I believe that Christianity is narrow in the sense that it is clear and it is specific about our need. It is clear and it is specific about God's provision for that need. But understand that Jesus coming and dying on the cross and bearing sin and giving us grace is not an effort to keep people out. This is, this is his, the point is to show you the way in. This is what Jesus has done for us. This is what I believe in, in my heart of hearts. And I understand that I'm, I'm coming at this from a Christian perspective. But this is what makes the message of Jesus so unique. It's, it's not about how religious you and I are. It's not about how many hours we've put in serving. It's not about how much money we've given. It's about a relationship with our creator God that is possible through faith, by grace, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We're gonna um, conclude this morning by wrapping up with a time of response and communion together. Um, if you've been around Chapel Street for a while, you'll know that we, we value this time together because it's such a clear and powerful picture of, of grace in our lives and what God has done for us. It reminds us of that message. If you're new with us this morning, 
Um, this, you do not have to be a member of this church or, or attended here for a long time to participate in communion. The only parameters that we see scripture place around communion is that we're in a, a relationship with Jesus, that we have claimed his grace and forgiveness and, and that we've identified with you. If you're still seeking, that's, that's absolutely okay. Um, you can let the tray pass by and, and, and just take in the moment. Um, I'm gonna pray for us and then you can take both cups. You'll see there's two stacked together and then I will come up and, and guide us through the taking of the elements together. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we have together. We thank you that we can meet you at the table once again to be reminded of the incredible gift of salvation that's available in you. And Lord, we understand that you have met our greatest need through your provision of Jesus Christ by grace. Lord, we ask these things in your name. Amen.